Deuteronomy 26. And it shall be, when thou art come in unto the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance, and possessed it, and dwellest therein, that thou shalt take of the first of all the fruit of the earth, which thou shalt bring of thy land that the Lord thy God giveth thee, and shalt put it in a basket, and shalt go unto the place which the Lord thy God shall choose to place his name there. And thou shalt go unto the priest that shall be in those days, and say unto him, I profess this day unto the Lord thy God, that I am come unto the country which the Lord swear unto our fathers for to give us. And the priest shall take the basket out of thine hand, and set it down before the altar of the Lord thy God, and thou shalt speak and say before the Lord thy God, A Syrian ready to perish was my father. And he went down into Egypt and sojourned there with a few, and became there a nation great, mighty, and populous. And the Egyptians evil entreated us and afflicted us and laid upon us hard bondage. And when we cried unto the Lord God of our fathers, the Lord heard our voice and looked on our afflictions and our labor and our oppression. And the Lord brought us forth out of Egypt with a mighty hand, and with an outstretched arm, and with great terribleness, and with signs and with wonders. And he hath brought us into this place, and hath given us this land, even a land that floweth with milk and honey." And now, behold, I have brought the first fruits of the land which thou, O Lord, hast given me. And thou shalt set it before the Lord thy God, and worship before the Lord thy God. And thou shalt rejoice in every good thing which the Lord thy God hath given unto thee, and unto thine house thou, and the Levite, and the stranger that is among you. And when thou hast made an end of tithing all the tithes of thine increase, the third year, which is the year of tithing, and has given it unto the Levite, the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow, and they may eat within thy gates and be filled. Then thou shalt say before the Lord thy God, I have brought away the hallowed things out of mine house, and also have given them unto the Levite, and unto the stranger, to the fatherless, and to the widow, according to all thy commandments which thou hast commanded me. I have not transgressed thy commandments, neither have I forgotten them. I have not eaten thereof in my morning, neither have I taken away aught thereof for any unclean use, nor given aught thereof for the dead. But I have hearkened to the voice of the Lord my God, and have done according to all that thou hast commanded me. Look down from thy holy habitation, from heaven, and bless thy people Israel, and the land which thou hast given us, as thou swearest unto our fathers, a land that floweth with milk and honey. This day the Lord thy God hath commanded thee to do these statutes and judgments. Thou shalt therefore keep and do them with all thine heart and with all thy soul. Thou hast avouched the Lord this day to be thy God, and to walk in his ways, and to keep his statutes, and his commandments, and his judgments, and to hearken unto his voice. And the Lord hath avouched thee this day to be his peculiar people, and he hath promised thee that thou shouldest keep all his commandments, and to make thee high above all nations, which he hath made in praise, and in name, and in honor, and thou and that thou mayest be an holy people unto the Lord thy God, as he hath spoken. We're going to start off right away holding our place in Deuteronomy 26 and go to Psalm 105. Psalm 105. Now this chapter in Deuteronomy kicks off with that phrase, and it shall be when thou art come in, Unto the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance, and possessed it, and dwellest therein. So this is how most often we hear God refer to his promised land. It's given, it's an inheritance. When you possess it and dwell therein, there will be certain expectations of you once you arrive there. But certainly it is a given thing of God, and he is promising it to them. In Psalm chapter 105 and verse 42, Psalm 105, and verse 42, the Bible says, For he remembered his holy promise, and Abraham his servant. 
And he brought forth his people with joy and his chosen with gladness and gave them the lands of the heathen and they inherited the labor of the people that they might observe his statutes and keep his laws. Praise ye the Lord. <clears throat> in verse 42 of this psalm, it highlights that the land was indeed promised, and holy promise made unto Abraham his servant, the servant of God. The friend of God, Abraham, received this promise first, and that was for the land they're about to receive. The Bible says in verse 43 there that God rejoiced to provide this. It says he brought it forth to his people with great joy. He gave it to his chosen people with gladness. It wasn't like it was hard for him to do. He rejoiced and wanted to give this holy promise unto his people. Verse 44, it says they were given, the people received something that they did not labor for. It says and gave them lands of the heathen. They inherited the labor of the people. In other words, these heathen nations that were all around them did the work built the houses, planted the vineyards, uh, put up the walls. They did all of that, and God's people inherited the labor of them. Here, I think that's highlighting that the gift is not of works. Right? They entered in without even having to work for the promise that was made. There's a little picture of our eternal salvation there in the receiving of the promised land by Israel. There was an end to it. There was a purpose to God doing this, though, and that's highlighted in verse 45. That they might observe his statutes and keep his laws. Praise ye the Lord. Amen. Praise God for that. The end of him promising, him rejoicing to provide and to give them a gift which they labored not for, a gift that was not of works completely free of charge, was that in the end they might observe his statutes and keep his laws. In other words, he gave them the promise that they should do good works. Unto good works is what our salvation is and, and it intended for. He saves us so that we could do works afterwards and that would be good and right and something that we ought to do as believers, compelled by the love of Christ to do good works for him. And the same was true of his people Israel, that they might observe his statutes and his laws was the intent that he gave them the promise and chose them as a special people unto himself. Back to Deuteronomy chapter 26. God in verse 1 says, this is a given inheritance. It's yours to possess and to dwell within and he wants in the end that they would do good works and they would follow his commandments and do according to his laws he's going to give one here in deuteronomy 26 and in verse 2 it talks about the first fruit of all the earth and just to highlight the fact that god was giving them something great that they didn't labor for remember in deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 10 it says he giveth thee a great and goodly cities which thou buildest not, and houses full of all good things, which thou fillest not, and wells digged, which thou diggest not, vineyards and olive trees, which thou plantest not. Truly this is a free ride offered unto God's people Israel. They would have instant prosperity. They would have instant comforts in his care as they entered into the promise of God. And here God highlights simply one thing that he would expect, one of those good works he would expect to be returned unto him as a result of this. Not so that they could receive the promise. The promise is already theirs. But here's what God gives them as a command and a statute. Now that they are arrived in the land. Or here, he's talking about when they one day will arrive in the land. Here he talks about the first fruits in verse 2. That thou shalt take of the first of all the fruit of the earth which thou shalt bring of thy land that the Lord thy God giveth thee and shall put it in a basket and shall go unto the place which the Lord thy God shall choose to place his name there. So as it has been in Deuteronomy to date, he's foretelling that there will be a place where he will put his name. And that's the place where all of the offerings are to be brought to him. The place where his name is, is the place where they will bring sacrifices. And here he says, they shall bring of the first fruits of the earth at that time. And when they do, they're to profess this in verse 3. And thou shalt go unto the priest that shall be in those days, and say unto him, I profess this day unto the Lord thy God, that I am come unto the country which the Lord sware unto our fathers to give us. 
Basically, they come with the first fruits of what they have received, not of works. Simply, they arrived and there was vineyards planted. They plucked it off. They took a portion of the first of it and placed it in a basket, brought it down, and made this great profession that essentially means they're a recipient of a promise and nothing more. I profess that I have received of the great promise of this country with which God swear unto our fathers to give to us. Verse 4, and continues on, it says, And the priest shall take the basket out of thine hand. Now when we see them make that statement in verse 3, professing themselves to be a recipient of promise, we ought to put ourselves in that same position and understand that we are the recipients of promises made unto God's people. And we also received of God's promises even before we were saved. He says the rain falleth on the just and the unjust alike. In other words, God provides the rain to make the plants grow, to provide the food and sustenance so that people have of good things that they can use to care for themselves. God provided all of these things. God provides even the breath that's in our lungs. 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 7 says this, What hast thou that thou didst not receive? What hast thou? What do you actually have that you did not receive as an extension of the grace of God? Really, there's nothing. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord, grace that exceeds all our sins and our guilt, grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all of our sin, amen, but also grace to simply just provide for us the basic things that we need. And honestly, rack your brain all you can. What do you have that you did not receive of the hand of Almighty God? And if thou hast received all these things, that verse continues, why dost thou glory? Why do we boast in the things that we have? Why are we full of pride in all of the things that we have? They were gifts unto us. They were given to us. Back in Deuteronomy 26 and verse 4, it says, The priest shall take the basket out of thine hand and set it down before the altar of the Lord thy God. And thou shalt speak and say before the Lord thy God, watch this, a Syrian Ready to perish was my father. And he went down into Egypt and sojourned there with a few and became there a nation great, mighty, and populous. Okay, you can turn to Genesis chapter 43. Genesis chapter 43, and we'll see what he's referring to here. Genesis 43. In Deuteronomy chapter 26, again, it says, A Syrian ready to perish was my father, and he went down into Egypt and sojourned there with a few, and became there a nation, great, mighty, and populous. In Genesis chapter 43, it talks about this nation, this Syrian that was their father, that was ready to perish. Genesis 43 and verse 1 says, And the famine was sore in the land. And it came to pass when they had eaten up the corn which they had brought out of Egypt, their father said unto them, Go again, buy us a little food. Certainly at this time, uh, Jacob, their father, was reaching out to Egypt in order to have provided for them what they needed. Ready to perish. There he was. Genesis chapter 46, it talks about how he went down into Egypt with a few. I'm showing you that it is indeed Jacob here that is being referred to as the father of these nations. So we've already heard that Abraham was the one that got the promise. Here we're referring to Jacob. It says in verse 46, or chapter 46 and verse 1, And Israel took his journey with all that he had and came to Beersheba and offered sacrifices unto the God of his father Isaac. So Israel or Jacob here steps out and goes on a journey to return to Egypt in order to have sustenance. And he went down with not a few, it says in verse 27, and the son of Joseph, which were born unto him in Egypt, were two souls. All the souls of the house of Jacob, which came into Egypt, were threescore and ten. So Abraham was promised the land, but also a seed as multi, as in, as as, uh, as as vast and and numerous as the stars of heaven, and the sand of the sea. And yet he didn't see that come to fruition in his life, nor in Isaac's life. And here, another generation has passed. Jacob or Israel here goes down to Egypt with a few. 
with only 70 people at this time. Now, it said of Jacob, and this might confuse some of us, it did for me at first, that he was a Syrian, okay? Genesis 47, across the page and in verse 9 you'll see. Now, one part of him being a Syrian is the fact, and you can go back and look in uh, Genesis 29 and through 31, is that when he lived with Isaac and when he was growing up, Jacob dwelt in Mesopotamia, which embodies what is now known as Syria. And so he was a Syrian then by location and by where he lived. But also more than that, I believe that statement, my father was a Syrian, is almost just alluding to the fact that he was not of this world. And why do I think that? Well, Genesis 47 to verse 9, Jacob actually says unto Pharaoh, the days of the years of my pilgrimage are 130 years. Few and evil have the days of the years of my life been and have not attained unto the days of the years of the life of my fathers in the days of their pilgrimage. And remember of um, Abraham and of Isaac and now of Jacob that they were dwellers in tents. They were pilgrims. They were strangers and foreigners in wherever nation they chose to dwell in or wherever God would lead them to dwell in. They never had a certain habitation. And so again, here at this time, they're believing God by faith to receive the promise because Where's our land, God? Where's our multitude of, of people as the stars of heaven, God? They're certainly believing that promise, but having not seen it at this time. And so he is a Syrian, a pilgrim, I believe also by extension is what he's being referred to. If you turn over to the page right in Exodus chapter 1, Exodus chapter 1, that phrase in Deuteronomy 26 of verse 4 through 5 talks about them being him being a Syrian, ready to perish, went down with a few. But it said that he would become a great, mighty, and populous people. There in Exodus chapter 1, look at verse 7. It says, And the children of Israel were fruitful. There it is. Fruitful and increased abundantly, and multiplied and waxed exceeding mighty, and the land was filled with them. Now there rose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. And he said unto his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come on, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply and it come to pass when they are when there falleth out any war, they join also unto our enemies and fight against us, and so get them up out of the land. Therefore they did set over them taskmasters to afflict them with burdens. And they built for Pharaoh treasure cities, Python and Ramathes. So here it's talking about how Israel went from being 70 to dwelling in Egypt many years and coming to be a great nation, so much so that the mighty nation of Egypt started to fear them. They were so numerous and they were so mighty and they were so abundant and, and fruitful in all that they did, being the people of the living God. Verse 12 Continues, and here's a little bit of a warning for any government that would seek to do such things. Verse 12, it says, But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew, and they were grieved because of the children of Israel. So Egypt found out very quickly that though they sent over them taskmasters, and though they afflicted them and tried to deal wisely and keep their numbers down and keep them defeated and keep them under of subjection, always laboring and, and building these great treasure cities, they found that the more that they afflicted the people of Israel, the more that they attacked and burdened God's people, the more they multiplied and grew strong. They were grieved because of the children of Israel, probably wondering why they could not defeat the children of Israel at this time. Excuse me. It continues on. In verse 13, it says, And the Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve with rigor, and they made their lives bitter with hard bondage in mortar and in brick, and in all manner of service in the field, all their service wherein they made them to serve was with rigor. In other words, hard labor, bondage, exhausting, tiresome, feeling defeated, being pushed as far as you can go is what the children of Israel faced. Now, while there is that warning to the governments to not burden God's people in such a way, there also here is a little bit of a warning to God's people in that 
Sometimes God's people have gone through in history much rigor, much bondage, much struggles in the lands that they dwelt in. It wasn't always a free ride, though they were promised that would come further down the line, and that's what we're reading about in Deuteronomy chapter 26. There was a hard road for them to get to the promised land. And you know what? Our promised land here for us might be heaven. We may not face a time when our nation turns to God and suddenly becomes godly and righteous and it's a blessed place to live in for Christians, but our promised land is heaven beyond and we may have to face in the meantime some bitter hard bondage. We may have to face in the meantime in this earth some some serving with rigor under the governmental authorities that we have at this time. But Keep assuring yourself of the promise that, look, even though we're pushed down, even though we're seemingly defeated and we're being persecuted, we will always become more strong as a result. That's the promise here that I see in verse 2. Going back to Deuteronomy chapter 26, we talked about um, who I believe this Syrian was, being Jacob, ready to perish, went down to Egypt, sojourned there, became great, mighty, and populous. And there at the end, we saw it, Exodus chapter 1, verse 6, and it says, And the Egyptians evil entreated us and afflicted us and laid upon us hard bondage. That's Deuteronomy chapter 26, and in verse 6. They were evil entreated. And today, at times, I feel evil entreated. Certainly wasn't as bad as it was for the people of Israel and Egypt at that time. We're not slaves. We're not being beaten. We're not building as... as uh, um, under our master's great walls or great towns or great cities in order for them to just keep their treasures in. We're not in that type of bondage, but we can be one day, and certainly that day may come that we get more and more impressed and evil and treated. And what should our response be? Well, it shows here. It says in verse 7, And when we cried. So they were afflicted. They had hard bondage laid upon them, but it says, And when we cried. Cry. That's the wisest thing that we can do is cry unto the Lord God of our fathers. The Lord heard our voice and looked on our affliction and our labor and our oppression. And so the wisest thing that we can do when we're being entreated wrongfully is to cry unto God. It says in the second part of that verse 7 that God heard. And as a result of hearing the affliction, the labor, and the oppression that his people were under... He brought and gave them great gifts. Verse 8, it says, And the Lord besought, and the Lord brought us forth out of Egypt with a mighty hand, with an outstretched arm, with great terribleness, with signs and with wonders. As bad as we think that Pharaoh's um, few taskmasters that were placed over Israel were, as, as hard as their force and power was upon God's people, can you imagine the force and power of God Almighty upon Egypt? With his mighty hand, his outstretched arm, his great terribleness, his signs and his wonders, it's beyond compare. Bring the taskmasters, if you will. Our Lord will come and bring us out of Egypt with that same mighty and terrible arm and hand and strength to save. And he also not only brings them forth out of Egypt with that power, he brought them unto a special place. Verse 9, it says, He brought us into this place and hath given us this land, even a land that floweth, with milk and honey. Now remember, this was foretelling what was to happen once they actually arrived in the promised land. They're to proclaim unto God as they bring the first fruits that we came on this long road to get to here. We faced hard bondage on the way, but you, through your mighty outstretched arm, your terribleness and your signs and wonders, brought us to this place, this wonderful place of milk and honey, and they're bringing what God has given them and laying it down in the portion of the first fruit before him. The Lord brought them out. The Lord gave them great gifts. So here he begins to explain what to do with those gifts that he had given to them early on in their arrival. Verse 10, it says, And now, behold, I have brought the first fruits of the land which thou, O Lord, hast given me. And thou shalt set it before the Lord thy God and worship before the Lord thy God. Verse 11, And thou shalt rejoice in every good thing which the Lord thy God hath given unto thee and unto thine house, thou and the Levite and the stranger that is among you. So God wanted them to simply provide back to him an example of 
how he has blessed. And this would have been an example from their heart, but also we'll find out soon that there was that portion of the tithe. The tenth of the first fruit of the increase is what they were actually giving. But I think that when people went into the promised land, found it flowing with milk and honey, were used to what they had been receiving previous and saw the abundance, they might have, out of the abundance of what they received, just poured out many blessings upon God. And at that time, they were able to, with all that they had received, with all that they had been given in that wonderful place, they were able to more than provide for the Levite, more than provide for the stranger and the foreigner that dwelt among them. And God says here that they are to rejoice in every good thing which the Lord thy God hath given them. And God certainly loves a cheerful giver. And they would have been, I think, at this time, an exemplary example of that. God wanted them to be prepared so that when they arrived, they would have their hearts ready to give abundantly back to him what he has provided for them. And here I believe what we're seeing is the foundation of the tithes. When they were first to step in, and this, this, um, this uh, what is it, the example? This feast was given back in um, Exodus, I believe was the first time, and then in Leviticus. This feast is the feast of the first fruits, is what they were going to, for the first time ever, perform when they arrived in the promised land. And it was to be a time of great rejoicing, celebrating all that God has given. But it's also the foundations of the tithes and offerings that weren't just to be that one time enter into the promised land and give. It was to be something that would continually happen in order to provide for the needs of the temple or the or the 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 needs of the priests, the needs of what happens before the altar, the stranger, the widow, the widow, the fatherless, and all these people would be provided with the tithes here in the Old Testament. In verse 12, in the first part of it says, When thou hast made an end of tithing all the tithes of thine increase in the third year, which is the year of tithing. So he says there in Deuteronomy 26 and verse 12, that when you have made an end of all the tithes in the third year. Now, I believe that is assuming that from the time of the first fruits until then, there was tithes happening in that first and second year as well. He says, when you bring the tithes in the third year and has given it to the Levite, the stranger, the fatherless, and the widows, that they may eat within thy gates and be filled. In other words, they would be provided and full as a result of the tithes that were coming in. And God here is just is not highlighting essentially their their giving as much as he's highlighting his provision. He was providing enough that they would be taken care of above and beyond what they need so that, look at this group, the Levite, the stranger, the fatherless, the widows, they may eat and be full. Today we don't have abundant beyond. Well, I think we do actually, but I think people tend to hoard it to themselves. But the stranger, the fatherless, the widow, there are so many people that are not cared for that in God's economy and his way should have been taken care of. And in Canada, if we would have done the same as God had expected, then we wouldn't have people that are lacking and suffering because God would provide abundantly and we should just give the first fruits. It should go through God's um, proper avenues, provide for the priests, the strangers, the fatherless, everybody that needs God's work would go forward and, and people would be provided for at this time. As a result of not people's giving hearts, but just because of they, they followed God's instructions and God certainly provided above and beyond all they can ask or think. Now regarding the tithes then, he says in verse 13, Then thou shalt say before the Lord thy God, I have brought away the hollowed things out of mine house and also have given them to the Levite and unto the stranger and to the fatherless, to the widow, according to all thy commandments, which thou hast commanded me. I have not transgressed thy commandment, neither have I forgotten them. So here he connects the tithes that they are giving in the first, second, and third year with, verse 13, it says, the hollowed things. He has brought away the hollowed things out of his house, given them to the Levite to distribute according to who has need. So then the tithes are hollowed things. And I believe we ought to consider our giving here in the New Testament church to be hollowed things, to be separated, to be holy things, to be special things. Giving ought not to be a begrudging task. It ought to be a wonderful and joyous task 
even as much as this offering of the first fruits was. Look at all that God has provided for us. And remember that lesson we thought of? Think of what you have that you did not receive as a gift from God. Do you have anything that wasn't received from God? Same as these people, as they enter into the promised land, or would one day enter into that promised land, everything that they have comes as a gift from God. And so, simply giving of what God has blessed you with ought to be a joyful and wonderful experience. And that ought to be come from a heart that is set apart, just like the things are set apart. The second part of 13 there talks about the commandments of God and how the people are pledging as they give this offering that they have done their best to do according to the commandments which he has commanded. They have not transgressed the commandments, neither have I forgotten them. Now, verse 14, it says, I have not eaten thereof in my morning, neither have I taken away aught thereof for any unclean use, nor given aught thereof for the dead, but I have hearkened unto the voice of the Lord my God, and have done according to all that thou hast commanded me. So here's the stewardship of God, and the example that they were given is that they would give with joy, they would not eat the hollowed things or partake of them in mourning or sadness. There too is to be a rejoicing. Neither would they take it and use it for something unclean because it's to be sanctified, the gift that you're giving to God's house and God's use. It says also, though, that it wasn't something that was given for the dead. In other words, again, it's not a mourning experience giving unto God of your first fruits. It ought to be a rejoicing experience. Here the, the, uh, the parishioner, the person that comes forward says, I have hearkened unto the voice of the Lord my God and done according to all that thou hast commanded me. Now, here is the, um, I'll just continue on. Verse, um, where am I now? It was commanded thing then. Okay, so continuing on in verse 15. It says, look down from thy holy habitation. So again, they come with the returning what God has given to them, a portion of it, the first fruits. They make this proclamation that their hands are clean, their heart is right, they're giving with rejoicing. And then at the end of all of that statement, verse 15, I, there's a prayer unto God. It says, look down from thy holy habitation, from heaven, and bless thy people Israel and the land which thou hast given us as thou swearest unto thy fathers a land that floweth with milk and honey. And so they are giving back what God has certainly given unto them, abundantly beyond what they could ever expect or need. And they're doing it with that, basically, foretelling of the promise that would come. By doing so, they're showing by faith that they understand that this isn't entering into the promised land and receiving all of this um, sustenance without having to work for it as a gift, that's not going to be just a one-time thing. God's going to continue to provide again and again and again and again, over and over, always taking care of their needs if they're following Him, if they're doing according to His commandments, if they are continually giving as they're expected and commanded to. And so when they ask God to look down from heaven and bless his people and continue to make this land a land flowing with milk and honey they're simply reminding god of the promise that he had already made and that's a good thing to do in our prayer life is to do god's will when you go to him for prayer remind him of the promises that he's made to you and there are scores of promises in the old testament and new testament where god just promises to provide for you for your family for your church and and for for your cities even at large if you do according to his will and here's what was happening. Now, they were to give of the first fruits. Verse 16, it says, This day the Lord thy God hath commanded thee to do these statutes and these judgments. So we got to figure that when we're looking here at chapter 26, he's not just talking about the statutes that are contained therein. But we have in chapter 25, the command to judge righteously. We have in chapter 26 uh, the command to be chaste and to be clean in our living. We have in chapter 23 the, the command and, and, and the theme of being separated unto God. And as we've been walking through Deuteronomy, I found that every chapter seemed to, to bear a theme 
that God wanted to teach us about and, and direct us towards. The first chapters, of course, just being a history of Israel. But after that, these commands that God is giving, these statutes and these judgments that he has commanded them, aren't simply contained in this one, give of thy first fruits, is what I'm trying to say here. So some can just take that and just say, okay, he's talking about the, the, the tithe here, right? That type of giving. But how much more could we, could we tithe of different things and give of different things? Every day you're given 24 hours to live. A portion of that, if you were to give it to God, one-tenth would be, let's say you're sleeping for eight hours of those days, you're awake for 16 hours, you, you could give 1.6 hours unto God, and that would be the first fruits of that day. Your energy... Do you take the energy that God gives you and spend some of that doing things that He wants? Whether it's laboring around the church, whether it's whether it's um, whether it's uh, you know doing things for your family, whether it's going soul winning, putting energy into the things of God. What about love? There's a great love wherewith God hath loved us, and we could take some of that and show it to our brethren. That can be other ways that we can give of our first fruits. It's not simply the tithes and the offerings. We're to do all of these things with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, as God hath commanded. In verse 16 it continues, The day the Lord thy God hath commanded thee to do these statutes, thou shalt therefore keep and do them with all thine heart and with all thy soul. Now we can... Con Consider something like this, and it's a good time for this, you know, us to just happen across Deuteronomy chapter 16, because God here is talking about they're one day going to enter into a new land, and they're going to face new commitments and, and new trials and new things that they have to experience that they ever have before as they've been wandering about in the wilderness. And it's just like us as we enter into a new year. And from where you're at, certainly some of us are into doing that type of thing, and some of us maybe aren't, but even as this message is being preached, we can start to consider some things where we're at that we could go and commit unto God to do better at, to do more of, and, and, and promise Him these types of things. Where do you want to go in 2021 for God? Where do you want to go this week for God? How far do you want to push yourself in order to work for Him and please Him? Here are the commandments to Israel. It was asked of them that thou shalt keep them with all thy heart and with all thy soul. And I know that there's areas of my Christian life that I'm not doing with all my heart, with all my soul, and with all my strength. And so as I was preparing this message, I started to think about different things that I could take to the next level. I could give more of my day, more of my energy, more of my love unto the things of God. Here in verse 17, it says, Thou hast avouched, thou hast answered, thou hast affirmed, and thou hast certified the Lord this day to be thy God. So the people are standing before the Lord at this time, and there is a covenant about to be avouched. The people, thou, Again, he doesn't say, ye have a vouch, so he's not trying to address the people at large. He's talking to individuals. Thou hast a vouch, the Lord thy God, to be thy God. We've, to walk in his ways, it says, and to keep his statutes, his commandments, his judgments, and to hearken unto his voice. And really, this is the type of a vouching, let's say, the type of um, answering back to God and certifying and affirming to Him that we ought to do every day. Every day we ought to wake up and before God say, you know what, I want to walk in your ways. I want to keep your statutes. I want to follow your commandments. I want to do your judgments and just listen to your voice as I go about. But again, we can just look at this as a daily by daily by daily thing, or we can start to think about this as, how do I want to live out my walk before God in 2021? Verse 18 then talks about God vouching back to us. Even as we promise to follow his ways, keep his statutes, seek after his commandments and do them, his judgments and hearken unto his voice. It says in verse 18, And the Lord hath avouched thee this day to be his peculiar people 
as he hath promised thee, and thou hast, shouldest keep all his commandments. In other words, God promises to his people here that they will be peculiar. They will be separated. They will receive of his promise. And one of his promises is not only the land, but watch this. It says, and to make thee high above all nations, which he hath made, in praise and in name and in honor, that thou mayest be an holy people unto the Lord thy God, as he hath spoken. So, when we looked at Abraham's life, and Isaac's life, and Jacob's life, all of them saw the promise afar off, but never received it. And now here, their children have died off, and we've seen generations 40 years long that have, have walked this walk through the wilderness, and now Moses is starting to transition into the people that will go with Joshua into Egypt, and he's basically giving them the same indication. Look, you have to receive this as a promise that you may never receive. It's something afar off. And this is what God is promising unto his people. It's always our expectation before him that we should keep his ways, statutes, commandments, judgments, and follow after that. Here God promises that we will be a peculiar people, but look at this, and that thou shouldst keep all his commandments. Now does that mean we certainly will always keep all his commandments? Not today, not tomorrow, but there's coming a day We'll be in heaven, keeping all of his commandments, because we will have no more of that sin nature pressing us down and oppressing us. That day will come, and God here is promising that they say that day certainly will be coming. Verse 19, it says, And thou, and to make thee an high above all nations, which he hath made. Now, here as Christians, citizens of spiritual Israel, we are certainly not above all nations. Definitely in praise and in name and in honor. They don't revere us. They don't look up to us. They don't seek to honor us. We are certainly a holy people in God's eyes, separated unto his purposes. But we haven't fully realized and received of the promise that he is making here. But we can see that afar off, can't we? Can't we look forward to the time when we will be in heaven abiding with him, receiving of that promise to be peculiar and separated to the extent that all nations around us would be praising us and lift us up in name and in honor, holy unto God, separating, separate unto him, even as he hath promised. Look forward to that. But here it starts with a commitment that God's people make to God and a commitment that God makes unto them. Our end is to keep and do his will. And certainly the Bible says that a just man falleth seven times and riseth up again. We're not going to be perfect today. In that verse 17, keeping his ways, statutes, and judges, we're not going to be perfect, of course. But we can fall seven times and rise up again by asking for forgiveness and seeking after God and having a heart that is ready to do better, prepared to do what God expects. But the good news for us is that while we may fall short of verse 17, breaking his statutes, breaking his commandments, not listening to his voice sometimes, the great news for us is that verse 18 and 19 were never about us doing verse 17. It was always about, like we learned about at the beginning of this chapter, his gift, his promise, and, and his plan for us. And that's what he says. He will never fall short of his promise to us. The gifts and calling of God are without repentance. And ultimately, God is calling every one of us to be peculiar unto him, to be high above all nations, to be lifted up in praise and in name and honor, be holy people unto God. And he will take care of of that portion. You can't do that for yourself. And so even as Israel entered into a land where there was no works to do because everything was already furnished, everything was already built, everything was already planted, so we are entering into a promise where we will receive perfection, keeping his commandments. We will be lifted up, we will be elevated and put on high as God's holy people, both in name and in honor among the nations that are here. And that will be God's doing. And isn't that marvelous in our eyes? It's a wonderful thing to see what God has promised for us. And he does it through a covenant, knowing that we're probably going to fall short of our end of the deal. And that's how God always has worked with his people. Grace and mercy. That's the truth of the scriptures. We need to receive of that gift that God is offering in the same way that they received it in Deuteronomy chapter 26. We do today. We receive the gift by faith. Seeing that promise and knowing that we will receive it afar off. We may never face it today. 
But it's a good thing to know that it's there, and it's a good thing, even as Israel did here, and they were commanded to do, to remind God of what he has promised us. So that even in our last day, when we think that you know there's, there's not a breath left in us, we can't go any further, we're, 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 we're struggling, we can say, you know what, God, you're going to exalt me one day. You're going to put me up in praise and in name and honor. It's going to be all according to your works, not mine own righteousness. And that'll be a wonderful day. Praise the Lord for that day when it comes.